pull all this information together and perhaps to tell us what it means, uh, Roger Moore will speak next. Uh, after getting his graduate degrees at Rice University, Roger uh, founded uh, the company that he's uh, still heads, uh, Moore Archaeological Consulting. He's done uh, uh, a great many works, perhaps 500 projects, small and large, altogether. Uh, and as I said before, his, uh, his newest area of expertise is conflict archaeology, the kind of battleground archaeology that we've been seeing uh, the evidence for today. Uh, evidence is one thing, a narrative is another. Uh, and pulling together, using that historical imagination uh, uh, to make sense out of all of this fragmentary information uh, is, what, uh, is what really is at the, is at the end of this tale uh, of archaeology and history pulled together. Um, and uh, I'm as anxious as you are uh, to hear what Roger has to say about, uh, about the project that is um, coming at least to the end of the first stage. Is that fair enough? Uh, uh, who knows where it's going to go beyond this, but please welcome uh, uh, archaeologist extraordinaire Roger Moore. Uh, thank you very much. It's, it's certainly a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, uh, we have been working, as you have heard, for, for quite some time at, uh, at the broader San Jacinto site. And we've probably come up with some elements of new information as well as a lot of important artifacts from our earlier work. Uh, for example, I think uh, uh, we're well on the way to answering questions about uh, the, uh, the size and the munitions of the, uh, used in the Twin Sisters on the basis of the, uh, of the canister uh, base plates. But uh, our being able to work at the NRG site uh, is uh, perhaps the first occasion where we're uh, able really to make uh, an original uh, contribution that, that parallels the historical record and firms up something that has been known uh, for a long time, but perhaps misplaced, certainly neb nebulously placed. Uh, and um, uh, we'll uh, move along by ad addressing uh, the first of uh, Dr. Demick's questions. And that was, uh, why are these artifacts in a line? Uh, the, this illustrates all the battle-related artifacts recovered from the NRG tract. And you certainly don't have much of a, uh, a hint of what's going on, uh, of why they're in a line uh, from the, the modern appearance of the tract with the tangle of uh, Chinese tallows and other uh, yopan and so forth that uh, literally made it almost impossible uh, for a metal detector to be used prior to the wood gayer process, which is probably one reason why we found as many material as we did because it became, within the last 30 or 40 years, it became essentially inaccessible uh, to due to the growth of, of Chinese tallows and uh, uh, other uh, shrubs in uh, what, what, what had previously been uh, the, edge of an open, the edge of an open prairie. Uh, this illustrates the alignment along the 19, uh, 1944 USGS uh, topographic map. And that begins to uh, show one of the ways uh, that uh, we're able to use our historical imagination, although uh, we cloak it in uh, terms of hypothesis generation. <laughs> we, uh, we uh, and I specifically wanted to approach uh, this site as well as the rest of San Jacinto first from, on the basis of the artifacts, what came out of the ground and, and its distribution and how it relates uh, to its surroundings. So uh, we began to, uh, I began to think uh, and discuss kind of uh, apart from but parallel to the historic record, uh, what kind of, of event could take place that would result in uh, a line of artifacts uh, of this character, a one that's about a 180 yards uh, wide by only 20 yards deep. 
And uh, one, of, one of the things that uh, comes to mind is that uh, a, a line of soldiers uh, either in, uh, in a long file or standing abreast, but then why, why are they dropping all their, uh, all their mili military goods at one time in this position? Uh, we, uh, and then again, uh, still taking the, uh, the environmental and uh, archeological uh, view of things, uh, we turn to uh, what Jeff discussed earlier, the landscape, the natural landscape. And uh, we find uh, through the GIS uh, process that uh, the over <coughs> using of these old, uh, old maps overlaying in their, their true geographic position that the uh, alignment of artifacts is, uh, is at the edge of a gully and that the gully uh, was one of the few places with trees in the, in the area. Uh, you see uh, you had trees uh, along Boggy Bayou and along the, along the shoreline and this smaller gully uh, which extended uh, to the southwest from Peggy Lake uh, uh, was also naturally uh, wooded. And of course, uh, you know, I'll end this this kind of polite fiction of of ignoring the hist uh, historical artifacts for the sake of of cogitating about what's I mean uh, the historical record for the sake of cogitating about what's there, and uh, uh, admit that it, or at the same time, of course, uh, that we were thinking about, you know, could this be, uh, could a surrender produce these sorts of things, or, or what's uh, what uh, what kind of other human activity associated with the battle would create a linear, linear alignment of artifacts. Uh, we started uh, to look seriously at the historical record to see uh, what kind of event uh, uh, recorded historically might uh, result in the uh, uh, dispersion of artifacts like we see in the field. And uh, we became uh, better and better aware, of course, of uh, the uh, Almonte uh, surrender of a group of two to 400 men uh, that is uh, at some point uh, ambiguously uh, placed. Oh, here's uh, another diagram of uh, individual artifacts. And back to uh, one of Dr. Demick's questions, the, uh, the uh, clusters of musket balls, and I think they are very, very useful in this instance uh, as a, uh, a uh, an indication uh, of in individual soldiers uh, uh, dropping m multiple uh, bundles of cartridges, uh, perhaps held in in fabric bags or something like that, that, that would not have the buckles that he were. That, that we find are startling the absence. Uh, oh, and uh, I, I am drawing from uh, Manuel's uh, lecture that we, we shouldn't certainly expect Mexican army uh, insignia and so forth to be GI in the American sense, you know, uh, any kind of high degree of standardization. They might be using the same uh, design themes, but there's going to be a lot of a lot more hand craftsmanship and and variation in the execution of things ranging from those grenadier badges to uh, cartridge buckles. Uh, we find that we, uh, that the artifacts and the historical record seems to, uh, for, uh, to come closest to uh, matching uh, the accounts of, of uh, the surrender of Juan uh, El Monte, and uh, I would refer to uh, you to that that cover illustrations on your uh, program. I would have included that in the in the slideshow, but I got distracted by the uh, belated visit from a Chronicle reporter uh, yesterday afternoon, and <laughs> and never got around to it. Uh, got back to it. Um, You've got to think about the situation uh, that these troops were in uh, at that at that moment in time. Uh, you know, uh, they've they've escaped the immediate carnage of the battle, and they, uh, we know that they're uh, they're fleeing 
uh, some of them are fleeing off to the southeast. Uh, we, we can tell, uh, we've got evidence for that in the scattered artifacts uh, that we found along Peggy Lake. Uh, but at that point in time, uh, they're, uh, they're, they're still in the stage of being a disorganized uh, fleeing mob. Uh, and they, they're going to be pursued at some point by the mass of the Texans who are still preoccupied back at the uh, at Boggy Bayou, uh, finishing off a lot of, uh, of their uh, companions. Uh, so the uh, it uh, choosing uh, you know a a good commander always looks at the landscape, and in this case. Uh, I, it's not a, a, a landscape of choice. It's a landscape that's dictated by, uh, by the circumstance of this retreat. And uh, it, it wasn't cho uh, chosen in, uh, in advance. Uh, we can agree that uh, it would take a commander uh, with an extraordinary cool and, uh, head to keep his wits and assert command over a large group of soldiers who had managed to escape the onslaught of the enraged Texans following the slaughter at uh, uh, Boggy Bayou. Uh, this hodgepodge of troops was a mixture of Mexican units, uh, and they're making their way across the prairie. Uh, but uh, who and what kept them from being ridden down and killed? At least one Mexican officer rose to this challenge late in that fateful day. Uh, while we be uh, believe that we know his identity, we have a uh, abundant and un unambiguous uh, physical presence of uh, physical evidence of his presence of mind and that of all the soldiers who followed his command. Obviously, I'm reverting to my written script since <laughs> not uh, doing so well as it off the cuff. But uh, the uh, resourceful officer recognized a place where the fleeing troops could be concealed long enough for a short respite from Texan p pursuit, a pause that was sufficient. Uh, to impose military discipline and turn the troops' helpless flight into an orderly capitulation. This act of command probably saved most of their lives, since scattered infantrymen in desperate flight have uh, been nothing better than lambs for the slaughters uh, for mounted cavalry since the time of Alexander. Uh, the commander managed uh, to gather several hundred troops organized them into a solid rank about 180 yards wide and at least of a couple of soldiers deep, and commanded them to lay down their remaining arms and march out of the, uh, the cover of the woods as a solid front to the scatter of a few Texas cavalrymen who were poised to attack in the prairie to the southeast. He knew that no matter how strong uh, those Tex Texans' lust for vengeance might be, uh, they would realize that they had no choice but to accept the surrender of such a large and well-organized group. And uh, what accident of topography uh, made that commander's uh, accomplishment possible, or at least much easier? The line of artifacts which uh, uh, we found coincided with the edge of a grove of trees next to a shallow gully, gully appearing on historical maps and aerial photographs. Uh, this marks uh, where several hundred Mexican so soldiers, uh, sheltered by tr the trees and organized by uh, Colonel Juan Almonte, employed discipline to force uh, the Texans to accept the surrender with dignity. Uh, this event was noted in the historical record, but was located incorrectly in some uh, accounts, uh, including the memo uh, memories of the uh, aged Texas uh, veterans who uh, journeyed to the uh, to mark the actual location of battle events in the 1890s. Uh, the, uh, some of the, uh, the variation in the historical accounts are depicted in this map. Uh, of course, there's uh, uh, the marker for the surrender is just on the uh, southeast side of Boggy Bayou, but uh, there's a, uh, accounts ranging up to uh, this uh, ra radius around the, uh, the center of the battlefield. Uh, uh, that's three miles away from uh, from the side of the battle. Oops. Uh, but here we have the red line uh, is about a mile and a half away, and that depicts uh, the actual distance from the center of the battlefield. Blue to, uh, pardon? Blue line. 
Blue line? Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, blue line with red dots there uh, is, is the uh, radius to the uh, discovery on the energy tract, and it's about a mile and a half uh, from the battle. Uh, we've already seen uh, a lot of the artifacts before, but the, one of the things they, uh, they bring home to us is that it was a mixture of troops. We probably got some, uh, maybe maybe majority of infantry, some cavalry and so forth, but uh, the uh, officers uh, and non-coms who were present were able uh, to bring together uh, what was uh, a rather disorganized and, uh, uh, group of men pe fleeing piecemeal across an open prairie where again they could be picked off uh, by cavalry uh, with savers with ease and form them up again into a disciplined unit uh, that could uh, uh, achieve a surrender that would not only uh, preserve a little bit of their dignity but also probably save their lives. So yeah, I think this, this event uh, was uh, a, uh, uh, a, the best possible end to what was otherwise a, a terrible day for the Mexican army. So thank you. We're going to have a few moments for off-the-cuff questions. One thing that should be pointed out for those of you who might not know is that Juan Almonte was perfectly fluent in English, uh, which I think is fairly important uh, in shouting uh, the desire to surrender at, uh, at the opportune moment. Almonte was educated in New Orleans and was fluent in uh, English and French as well as Spanish and is well known during the revolution to have used his uh, command of the vernacular English to uh, fool more than one person uh, uh, into thinking that maybe the Mexicans weren't next door but someone else. Um, do we have any very quick questions before, uh, before we take our break? Yes, sir. How deep beneath the surface were you finding these artifacts? How deep beneath the surface were you finding these artifacts? Uh, mostly a foot or less. Are these on? Yeah. Uh, mostly a foot or less. Uh, the, uh, a lot of them were just a, a matter of several inches. Uh, one thing that sometimes limits is the, the strength of the metal detectors, so we're not guaranteeing that there isn't anything deeper, but we have fairly good metal detectors. I think the uh, deepest things we found were about 30 centimeters, if I'm not mistaken. And we might add that in, in the case of the, uh, the NRG track, uh, since the uh, the archaeology Roger, division, for the sake of the uh, BBD, would you come over here? Oh, sorry. Uh, and I might add that uh, with the in the case of the uh, NRG tract, uh, since the archaeology division of the Texas Historical Commission, uh, under uh, the direction of Jim Bruseff and Mark Denton, brought their uh, magnetometer to the site. Uh, we uh, have a good, uh, a good degree of confirmation that we got all the ferrous, all the iron uh, artifacts out since uh, we seem to uh, have, uh, their, their results were negative indicating that we, we had found everything that was uh, there to find. One last question before we uh, break. Yes, ma'am, back in the back. NRG, uh, which I discovered uh, uh, was, was a sort of, uh, of a magic way of saying energy, is the name of the company who owns the tract of land and uh, whose, uh, whose executives were given the award at lunch today. Uh, and it stands for? Uh, I asked that very question at lunch today. And uh, there are a number of myths and mysteries according to their own <laughs> PR people. Energy is one. Um, non-regulated generation was another, uh, and, and that's somewhat of an of a inside energy joke, <laughs> energy and RG. Uh, anyway, um, so I guess it, it, uh, it doesn't really stand for anything specific. It's just the company's name. Um, 15 minutes seems like a pretty good uh, uh, amount of time for a break, uh, rather than the 10 minutes that's on your official schedule. We will still get back and start at 4 o'clock. Uh, if you want to have any written questions submitted, bring them up here and put them on the podium. 
and we will, uh, uh, first of all, before you do anything else, let this group know how much you appreciate the hard work they've done. Thank you. And uh, if you, yeah. Hang on just a second. They've decided to say something in return. <laughs> something uh, something uh, that uh, Dr. Demick pointed out to me uh, I should have done and uh, will now take the opportunity to do. I'd like to ask everyone who volunteered uh, out of uh, the, either the uh, energy project or the other uh, earlier work uh, to please stand up and be acknowledged. Come on, guys. Uh, what first led you to the NRG site and when? Uh, are there plans to continue further exploration? And um, I'll, I'll save some of the other questions for later, but, but what led you first to the site? What led us to the site uh, is what w what anthropologists would call informants, <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, what folklorists might what folklorists call, might, like, might call legend. Uh, anyway, the uh, word was uh, was brought to us that over the years, uh, uh, artifacts related to the battle had been found in that general vicinity. Of course, we had no idea exactly where, and because the tract was so thickly vegetated, uh, we were not at all confident that we could be successful in finding uh, them, especially if, if they were as scattered as they were in, uh, along Peggy Lake. Uh, but uh, uh, thanks to a combination of luck and, uh, and a reasonably well-designed sample scheme, uh, we, uh, we hit uh, that concentration uh, twice uh, and uh, made in our transects, uh, our initial transects, and that made it, uh, everything went from that point upward <laughs> in our, uh, in the way we, we feel about it. Uh, there probably is uh, some more work to be done uh, to make sure we, uh, there, uh, that we followed the, the concentration out completely. Uh, uh, it was mentioned that, uh, that uh, some of the uh, that the high power lines would have uh, interfered with, uh, with the metal detectors uh, on one edge of the, of the concentration, and we may be able to come to, uh, find some technological uh, fix for that problem to find out whether the material really extends that way. And of course, uh, the deciding factor, uh, uh, there are two deciding factors. One is, is uh, uh, that we continue to uh, remain in NRG's good, uh, good graces, uh, and uh, one way to help that uh, happen is uh, for everyone to continue to respect their private property rights uh, by uh, staying off the land which is fenced and uh, patrolled by the uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. And the other way uh, is through uh, continued funding uh, for the overall uh, Arche the archaeology and the overall restoration of the park, uh, which is handled uh, through the uh, Friends of the San Jacinto Battleground As uh, Association, uh, the Friends Group for the uh, park and the uh, sponsors of this, uh, this symposium. Roger, if you'll stay at the mic, there's a quick follow-up uh, since you spoke directly to the Almonte Surrender Hypothesis. Uh, one uh, patron asked, where can one find written references to Al Monte Surrender? Uh, I'll let, uh, do you have it? Sure. Um, we've, as far as where, uh, it's, it's a mixture of sources. Uh, I found some in uh, uh, the quarterly of the Texas State Historical Association. Uh, that narrows um, it down to about 100 years. I know, it's a, it's a <laughs> volume four, number four, April 1901. That's better. Uh, there was one from the annual publications of the Historical Society of Southern California, of all places, uh, which is a. Uh, I'm sorry. Just read. Do yeah. you have a, a sentence or two of the? That? Well, in in that case, uh, this one says Almonte, finding all was lost and fearing all would be cut to pieces, placed himself at the head of three or four hundred men, 
form them into a column four or eight deep, four or eight, I don't know, uh, and threw down their arms um, and then held up the white flag and surrendered to them at once, surrendered them at once to a small body of troops who were in pursuit and they all marched into camp together. So that's one source. Uh, R.J. Calder has, has an account where he talks about Colonel Almonte's halt, uh, let's see. Just before the sunset, the pursuit and massacre was brought to a sudden stand by Colonel Almonte's halting the terrified Mexicans in a so solid body or column and making a formal surrender. Uh, Pedro Delgado has some discussion that, that uh, that lent, led us in the right direction. Uh, the Journal of Nicholas Labadee, uh, also uh, Stephen Sparks' account. He's the one who says that Almonte surrendered three miles away from where the battle occurred. Uh, Amesa Turner has uh, some surprisingly detailed, if, if uh, not precisely accurate distances that he, he describes as to where the surrender occurred. And then uh, just more recently, I don't have it in this one, but. Uh, we, we found a source that said two miles, and uh, all of those distances, uh, our site falls within a, a in-between space between them. So it's, it's multiple sources, and it was just a lot of historical research. Just a quick follow-up for Sam Haynes. Could you expand briefly on something called the theory of oppression, a term that was used? I, I was that, asked that after my talk, and I uh, haven't uh, had a chance to take a look at that citation. But uh, whoever asked me that question, uh, I'll give you my email after the um, uh, after the session here, and uh, I'll send I'll send it to you. Okay. Oh, uh, this is a question asked by two people. What effect has subsidence had? on the investigation and searching for artifacts. I guess that's another way of saying what might be uh, uh, underwater. I'll go ahead and take that one. Uh, the San Jacinto um, is exactly ground zero for the greatest subsidence in the uh, Houston-Galveston area. Uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife, our uh, water folks and our uh, uh, geologists have been studying this for a number of years and have determined that we've lost anywhere between eight and 10 feet in elevation at San Jacinto. Boggy Bayou itself is probably the, uh, the biggest evidence of that. Uh, some of the maps that you saw earlier show Boggy Bayou as a very um, wide landscape feature, which today is simply water filled. We did a, uh, a remote sensing study out there, and I've been out on Boggy Bayou myself uh, in a boat with a uh, just a long stick. And until 1985, there was a road that went from one side to the other. We found it at a depth of six feet with approximately two and a half feet of silt on top of it. That road was placed there, uh, I believe, in the in the 30s. And after 50 years it went underwater and after another 25 years or so, it is so far underwater that it's got two and a half feet of more material on top of it. Uh, so what is still out there that may be underwater is probably mostly in the Boggy Bayou area. The Texan camp now has levees to keep that area from going underwater. So rather than being underwater, the evidence there may have uh, either been filled over top of by the levee up against Buffalo Bayou um, or um, may even have been cut as, as the stream widened itself there. Other parts of the, uh, the battleground itself are high up enough that we, uh, the, the battleground proper, the 1,200 acres that Parks and Wildlife manages, uh, that's not going under, although the Peggy Lake area, that, that entire channel has changed and Peggy Lake is, no longer exists. It's now known as the Peggy Lake fill area. It's uh, essentially a dumping grounds for the Houston ship channel. So everything on that side and the marsh along that side along the San Jacinto, not along Buffalo Bayou, but on the east side, that is, has either gone underwater or has gone under as much as perhaps nine feet of fill. What we 
might or might not have been able to find there would have been the number of soldiers who were killed as they tried to get across those marshes and as they hit the deeper water and the mud, the Texans were mowing them down and you can read that in any of the documents. Um, we'll probably never see any of that evidence archeologically. Uh, here's a question which I'll try to, uh, to answer myself. Did General Gaines' soldiers help Sam Houston whip the Mexicans at San Jacinto? Uh, and the answer is almost certainly yes, as those who were regular annual uh, attendees to the symposium. I believe, uh, Bill and I believe it's Marjorie Walraven. Is that, have I got the name right? Uh, B Bill and Marjorie Ma Walraven have extensively investigated this and have identified uh, perhaps as many as 200 so-called deserters. Uh, from the United States Army, many of him, many of whom brought their own bayonets uh, across the line from Louisiana to Texas. Uh, there were uh, almost certainly United States soldiers, some of whom went back to the United States Army, some of which decided to stay in Texas. And you don't find their bayonets on the battlefield because they lived and kept them. But yes, uh, and the Wall Ravens have written that up in an article I think about three or four years ago in the Southwestern Historical Quarterly. But uh, if, you, if you'll uh, uh, search uh, the article by the Wall Ravens in, that, in the Quarterly, you'll definitely find the answer to that. Here's an interesting question. How does one become an archaeological volunteer? Well, we've got, we've got uh, two sorts of volunteers that have been working with us. Uh, the metal detectorist, that awkward term that uh, we coined uh, and imposed on Dr. Demick and his uh, crew, and uh, people who are uh, av uh, avocational archaeologists whose interest uh, can be uh, not uh, more extensive but broader because they uh, probably are interested in prehistoric Indian sites as well as historic period sites. And uh, those folks are. Uh, members of the Texas Archaeological Society, uh, which has various chapters around the state, including uh, large ones in, in Houston and in Fort Bend County, uh, and then more narrowly within the group of avocational archaeologists, there's the, uh, uh, the members of uh, the Office of the State Archaeologist Ar Archaeological Stewards Network. Uh, these are people who have had additional training and are certified uh, by the state uh, to act as kind of agents for the, histo uh, uh, for the historical commission out uh, in uh, various regions spread all the way ac all across Texas. Uh, so uh, they, uh, when the THC gets calls about uh, something eroding out of a creek or, or hit by a road construction, they call on the stewards to go out and uh, look at these things and evaluate them uh, because they're on the scene and they can respond quickly. Uh, most of our avoca arch avocational archaeologists, uh, people have been archaeological stewards or people uh, in, uh, you know, uh, similar people in, uh, in the Houston Ar or Fort Bend archaeological societies. And then uh, uh, Dr. Demick has coordinated uh, the whole uh, metal detectorist uh, volunteer effort. Uh, so uh, defer to him uh, in uh, uh, describing the criteria of that. But uh, uh, of course, one of the basic ones is that uh, they, uh, they work, they have to work a lot more slowly than they're used to because they have to go along with, with us picky archeologists who uh, have to plot in all the finds and uh, dig everything. and. Uh, which includes, of course, when we're back in the park, an amazing number of tab tops and other uh, pieces of junk and uh, aluminum cans. Uh, that's, that was one of the nicest things about working in the NRG tract. It's been, uh, you know, private property for so long uh, uh, that there, were, uh, there was very little in the way of modern debris there. Uh, well, one thing I'd like to, to oh, I'm sorry, Ron. One thing I'd like to point out, even though this may sound a, a bit elitist, is that uh, because of the nature of this project, when we're on the state lands, we're doing everything under uh, an antiquities permit to Parks and Wildlife or, or Rogers Company. And the volunteers that we use are all trained. We don't take anybody in who hasn't had any archaeological training. They must know archaeological techniques for a number of reasons, but the most important being that the artifacts that you're seeing here 
If they are hit in uh, being taken out of the ground by a shovel, we can destroy them. Understanding the way these machines operate, why the, the way the metal detectorists, those individual people operating a metal detector operate, the, the sp specific information that we are looking for as those objects come out of the ground, that's done uh, through a very specific set of protocols that everybody that works on this project understands. So um, I, don't, I don't want to um, uh, disimbue anybody of, of trying to become a volunteer, but you do need to go through the training with the Archaeological Stewards Program with the Historical Commission or the Texas Archaeological Society in order to become one of our volunteers. Uh, and despite that, um, the only people up here that are being paid to do that are, are Roger and Douglas. We have a huge contingent of people who do that and yet, despite the fact that the only, only two people paid, we have, we have two of the best experts in the world, and Manuel and Greg Dimmick, in these types of artifacts. And that just shows the uh, amount of time and effort that they have personally put into this. Don't forget that Doug did his work for free. Right, and, and, and Dr. Scott, Doug Scott, did, uh, did his work for free because he's just very interested in it. But let me say that if you are interested in becoming an archaeological uh, volunteer, the, uh, uh, the best route to begin that process is uh, through one of the local chapters of the Texas Archaeological Society. Uh, <coughs> check in your community and see if, uh, if, there, uh, if there is one nearby. And of course, if you live in the Houston area, I've mentioned that there, uh, there, uh, there are, are several in this area. And the best route to go home if you're leaving here today is not to go down Spur 5 to I-45 because it's now underwater. Uh, so you might want to go Elgin uh, or some other route away, but you know how low it gets down there as you turn around and get on 45 uh, from Spur 5 as you leave the University of Houston. Uh, you might want to give the water a little time to uh, drain. As Dave Britton, uh, Dave Britton reminded me yesterday that I went to school at William, Marsh's, uh, William Rice's Marsh. Uh, and uh, there's a certain flatness to this territory that makes rain a problem. Um, let me uh, ask uh, the next question of Sam Haynes. This is a question that he addressed to a certain extent uh, when I heard him give a talk uh, recently. Was Mirabeau Bonaparte Lamar for or against the annexation of Texas to the United States? Well, um, I, I'm sure you're referring to the, to the second annexation attempt, not the first. Uh -huh. uh, the first annexation attempt he was obviously uh, opposed to. Um, Texas nationalism, as he understood it, was based on this desire to um, protect, um, as he said, our peculiar interests, and that meant slavery. And in the 1830s, of course, uh, slavery was under attack in the United States, uh, in the northern states. And um, in 1845, he was in Georgia, and he came back to Texas, and he had the, um, not only did he campaign for annexation, but he also had the temerity to say that he had been for annexation all along. Uh, which made absolutely no sense whatsoever. Um, but his reasoning uh, did make some sense. Uh, in 1845, the reason he's for annexation is because he believes that uh, there is now a greater uh, threat to Texas slaveholders. Not only is there a greater threat to Texas slaveholders, but a greater threat to Southern slaveholders. And it's not William Lloyd Garrison, and it's not the Boston, uh, New, the New England Anti-Slavery <laughs> Society. Uh, it's Great Britain. Uh, after the Emancipation Act of 1833, and this, this fear that Great Britain might actually become, uh, might try to make uh, Texas a client state of the British Empire, uh, this had really uh, given uh, Mirabeau Lamar, like a lot of other Southern slaveholders, like John C. Calhoun, a uh, real pause uh, and real grounds for for concern. So in both cases, he was opposed to annexation initially because he wanted to protect slavery um, in Texas, but he supported it in 1845 um, for the very same reason. Can I add to that? Lamar also had an ulterior motive because in the claims for the Republic of Texas, he had deferred 10,000 of his salary as president and did not draw it and just left it in the treasury. And uh, when Sam Houston followed him, he refused the authorized the, the, the payment to Lamar. So when Texas was annexed to the United States, Lamar was a creditor for his $10,000 as president. He had never yet collected, and they thought that uh, annexation to the United States would give their it w would give them their best shot at being paid. <laughs> did he get paid? And uh, did he did he get it's, paid? You'll have to find the end of the book, and it's like giving <laughs> you the hair. <laughs>
It's like giving you the end to Harry Potter. Um, and, and I remember Sam uh, reading in one of Lamar's correspondence uh, when he was president of the Texas Republic, he got a letter from the Deep South saying that I hope you'll hold fast to Texas independence so that the rest of the, so that the southern states uh, can join you when they leave the Union. This was the talk that was going on in the 1830s when, uh, 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 late 30s, early 40s, when Lamar uh, was president. So it is a mistake always to forget that slavery is very much a part of what's going on in Texas. Uh, uh, when the Civil War began, one out of every three Texans was a slave. Uh, and uh, slavery is a very important part of the diplomatic history of the Texas Republic as well as the political history. Uh, it's very often in the background and it's not talked about in the textbooks, but you ignore it at your peril. Uh, let me uh, ask another question which I think is going to be very interesting to everyone here. What will be the final disposition of the artifacts from the NRG site? Uh, NRG has, has graciously given Texas Parks and Wildlife uh, ownership of those artifacts. Uh, I, I can't say enough about the stewardship of that company. They, they've um, been traded a couple of times. They've got uh, new owners, new presence and everything, yet the people that we uh, are working with there are absolutely fabulous and have said, look, this is important. This needs to go to somebody who can steward those artifacts. So my archaeology lab in Austin will have those artifacts. Um, we hope to see them displayed in a visitor center that, as you heard earlier, will be constructed somewhere on the battleground uh, in the next several years. The information, the lessons that we're learning about both the NRG tract and the, uh, the areas inside the battleground proper uh, are all wrapped up in those artifacts. So that lesson for the teachers bringing their children there and for anybody coming from, you know, pick a state, those artifacts are a main part of that story. So we will we'll be displaying some of them. And, and I might want to mention the five of the artifacts, uh, five or six of the artifacts from the Mexican camp are, are going to be displayed at the Sam Houston Memorial Museum in Huntsville for the next year. So those are from the previous digs, but they're still very exciting artifacts. And uh, a very important uh, aspect of, of uh, getting the information out on, uh, on the NRG tract, uh, we have both as a professional and, and really a contractual obligation under our, uh, our, uh, the uh, National Park Service Battlefield Protection Grant uh, we uh, will submit a final report on the, uh, all the work we've done there. Uh, we, we've already submitted a draft, but it did not, uh, did not include this last phase of the investigation, so we will revise that draft uh, to include the, the, uh, the swath area, the, uh, the major removal of the trees and the final artifacts that were recovered in that. Uh, and that... Uh, that uh, document uh, will be uh, published uh, uh, in a manner specified by the Park Service as part of the grant. Well, we've been swinging back and forth here between the macro and the micro. Let's go back to the macro again. Um, and I know that this, uh, this uh, set of three questions uh, is, if, is by a teacher, if not a professor. Uh, please discuss the following events. Uh, I make out tests like that sometimes. <laughs> Uh, and I'll try to take the first one. Sam Houston's maneuver of the Texan army into the territory between the Neches and the Sabine River. Um, one of our speakers has already referred, re referred to uh, Andrew Jackson's peculiar view of the Texas boundary with the United States, or the Mexican-Texan boundary with the United States. There's a really interesting letter that Sam Houston wrote during his retreat. Uh, to his friends in Nacogdoches. I don't remember if it was to Anna Ragay or her father. But um, he says, remember that old Hickory claims the Neches as the American boundary. That's west of Nacogdoches. And he says, don't worry about, uh, about anything happening to you as long as you stay in Nacogdoches. Uh, my late friend Tom Lindley, and also my late enemy Tom Lindley, we had a kind of love-hate relationship, <laughs> uh, as did many of Tom's friends. Uh, uh, Tom Lindley uh, found uh, 
uh, evidence of close correspondence, uh, couriers going back and forth between Sam Houston during his retreat and Fort Jessup on the American side. Uh, couriers, uh, people claiming their, their bounties, not their bounties, but their compensation for going back and forth as couriers between Houston's army. And also there's that curious period of February uh, 1836 where according to most, uh, most Houston biographers, he's negotiating with the Cherokee. Well, he didn't need to negotiate with them for a month. <laughs> Uh, and uh, there's very good evidence that he's in East Texas and in contact with the American army at Fort Jessup. Uh, uh, with regard to the, man the last maneuver, I know some people have alluded already today to the, uh, without mentioning it, to the Witchway Tree, uh, where Sam Houston decides perhaps to follow his army, perhaps not, uh, down towards San Jacinto. Uh, look, Sam Houston didn't decide that day to go to San Jacinto, no matter what uh, Dennis Quaid or, or, or uh, wanted, to, wanted to, you know, dream about uh, in, in, in that movie. Uh, and most people, uh, many very good historians, uh, have made the mistake of thinking that Sam Houston crossed over at Harrisburg, uh, across Buffalo Bayou, because there are things dated from Harrisburg, but they're on the north side of the bayou. And Sam Houston continued to go east along the north side of the Buffalo Bayou, on the opposite side from where San Jacinto is, from where the battleground now is, until they got word from captured Mexican couriers as to exactly where Santa Ana was. A courier with William Barrett Travis's saddlebags was caught and delivered to Houston, and, they, and he knew because of those letters back and forth between the Mexican army that Santa Ana was out there with a corporal's guard, a kind of rapid movement to go out and try to catch those Mexican politicians that we heard about today from Jim Bevel, uh, I'm sorry, the Texan politicians, uh, Lorenzo de Zavala, David Burnett, uh, the others. It's only when he got that news of where Santa Ana was and how many, how few men he had with him that he ordered the destruction of a farmhouse on the north side of Buffalo Bayou. Now why, uh, I like to ask so, audience questions, why did he destroy that farmhouse? So he could make a raft out of the floor. So he could make a raft out of the floor. Get the artillery they, had, the they, had hardwood, they had hardwood floors in that farmhouse and uh, he took a long time to ferry not only the artillery, those two cannon, but also the, many of the men across Buffalo Bayou. It was a, it was a lengthy operation to cross Buffalo Bayou uh, east of Harrisburg. And in many ways, that's when the die was cast. Uh, because now he's on the south side. Uh, and now he's going to have to meet up with Santana. And now he's making that run to Lynchburg, uh, to, or at least to Lynch's Ferry. But the critical move, in my opinion, uh, is not which direction they went at the fork of the road between Nacogdoches and down towards Harrisburg. He never went to Harrisburg. He stayed north of the bayou until he found out where Santa Ana's army was, and then he crossed. And that seems to me the critical decision uh, in, the, in, in Sam Houston's uh, campaign, to cross over where, if caught by Santa Ana, he cannot easily cross over again. It's do or die after they cross Buffalo Bayou. Uh, let me uh, uh, ask another question. Uh, obviously, Mexico lost, and I want Greg Dimmick perhaps to address this one. Obviously, Mexico lost the battle against Texas at San Jacinto. What happened to all the cannons, rifles, and other military equipment that the Mexican army had with them? Um, well, I don't think it's obvious that the uh, Mexican army lost the Texas Revolution at San Jacinto, you gotta read my book, Sea of Mud, there were still 4,000 Mexican soldiers in Texas. Uh, it, uh, the Sea of Mud was another blow to them, but it was uh, obviously a, a huge strike one against them, San Jacinto was. Most of the stuff that uh, was, was captured, and, and there's somebody here that knows more about it than I do, but I'll do a good job of, I think, uh, of summarizing it for him. Joe Hudgens uh, has excavated post-West Bernard with the Houston Archaeological Society. And that was a, a Republic of Texas uh, gun repair armory type thing. And it was on the West Bernard River. 
in what's now Wharton County, and they had, they were there for a year and a half or two years repairing a lot of guns. Most of them seem to be Mexican guns. I believe they set up an armory in Houston, and I don't know whether that was before or after uh, uh, post West Bernard, but the Texans took those guns, they used them at, in their army, they repaired them at that armory, they stored them at Houston and at post West Bernard. They had a cannon there, uh, the, uh, the uh, one cannon that the Mexican army had there at San Jacinto. It, it's a good question what happened to that one. There is one uh, a document that says that a, a, a Texan ship was captured. I don't remember the name of it. I know that William Wharton was on it because he was a captive of the Mexicans in about 1837. There's a document that says on that ship was a bronze cannon that had a plaque on it that said it was captured at San Jacinto. So it's possible that's where the golden standard, uh, what happened to it. Talk with Jeff Dunn about whether it was ever called the, the golden standard. There's a lot of uh, doubt about that. Here's one from Manuel Hinojosa. Is the preserved cloth with copper or cupric residue the remains of uniform filigree? If so, does that indicate the presence or remains of an officer or of an elite soldier like Dragoon? Well, well I think that answer, is that answer to that question is going to be, uh, it's going to come out when some uh, lab investigates it, but but my guess on something like that is that the, the material seems to be a, a finer uh, cloth and it has, it, it evidently was, it had structure in it that, that probably uh, uh, would, would come in from more of an elite group. Keep in mind your infantry soldier was, was a grunt. He w was very simply <coughs> dressed and the only ones that would have that fine cloth would have been an officer and or a cavalryman because cavalrymen usually if if you had a horse you were in a cavalry and a lot of your horse people were hacienda people so to answer the question uh, i think you'd more likely it'd be an elite uh a soldier or officer here's one where i don't know the answer i don't know if anybody else in the room does but we i ought to know the answer and i'm not sure is sam houston known to have visited the alamo site after the revolution does anyone know? Anyone know if Sam Houston is, 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 is uh, known to have visited the Alamo site? I simply don't know. I have been. What's the what's the what's the build what's the building date of the Minger Hotel? I would be I would be very surprised. I would be very surprised if uh, uh, if in his career as a United States Senator and then later Governor of Texas he never visited San Antonio again. And if he were in San Antonio, I would be extremely surprised if he did not visit the Alamo site whether or not he wanted to blow it up. Uh, here's a good question. Can we use the GM-63, is that the right term? EM. The, can we use the EM-63 to find the twin sisters? <laughs> my, my best guess would be no. <laughs> um, Dr. Everett use, has used the, the machine on uh, he mostly uses it on places where they know something is. It's it's much harder to use the machine in an explore, a purely exploratory <coughs> mode. Uh, so unless we have a really good idea of where the twin sisters are to begin with, at least the general location, I, I don't know that would be that useful. Best I can do. Uh, here's one for for James K. Polk's biographer. Uh, Discuss the following event. <laughs> James Knox Polk's 1846 American blood has been shed on American soil addressed to Congress. Discuss it in what way? Um, <laughs> I, I'm not sure um, what I can say about it. It was um, 
clear, clearly disingenuous. Um, I don't think American blood had been spilled on American soil. I think Lincoln was right in asking him to, uh, when he uh, proposed the, the spot resolution to name the exact spot where American blood had in fact been, been shed, uh, I would say that. Um, Polk's um, position on the boundary is a very interesting one. Uh, if you go back and you look at the campaign, um, he is, when he's campaigning for the presidency, he says on many occasions, because this was a, an important issue, uh, that Amer and Amer many Americans realized that the Mexican claim was a very good one. And he, compensation for Mexico is something that he is very much in favor of and uh, supports, uh, he is on the record supporting compensation for Mexico in the campaign of 1844. Um, but once he becomes president, then he suddenly changes his mind. Now, why he changes his mind is anybody's guess. Um, but uh, by 1846, uh, in fact, long before that, by uh, 1845, uh, shortly after the inaugural, he is absolutely convinced that the Rio Grande is the legitimate boundary of Texas. He basically uh, takes the Texas view uh, at face value, and no longer is he talking about um, uh, compensation. Now, he sends Slidell to Mexico, um, to, um, to dangle some money in front of Mexican leaders. Uh, but he doesn't really believe that they have any right to that, uh, and any right to compensation. He is assuming that the Rio Grande has become, has always been the, the, uh, the Texas boundary and therefore is the American boundary after annexation. Thank you, Sam. Uh, by the way, uh, Texas claimed that the Rio Grande was the boundary all the way to its source. Obviously, baloney. Uh, you know, this includes Santa Fe, the capital of New Mexico. Uh, if Laredo was part of Texas, then so was Santa Fe. Uh, that must mean Laredo isn't part of Texas. Uh, the Nueces had always been the boundary. Sam Houston had to veto a bill the Texan Congress passed making the Pacific Ocean the boundary of Texas. <laughs> uh, so though, those of you who see uh, the Rio Grande River as the boundary of American soil are simply buying propaganda. It was disputed, but Mexico had the better claim. Uh, I think that's, uh, that, that's fairly obvious. No, yeah, I, I, I think Jim is exactly right. And one of the things that always bothers me in uh, Texas textbooks, history textbooks, and, and American history textbooks, is that it's such a complicated issue uh, that they just simply say, well, it's a disputed boundary, and they leave it at that. And that doesn't really do it justice because that sort of assumes that both sides have the, uh, the equally good claims. And, and Jim's right, the Mexican claim is, is, by far, is, is much better, in my view. That is, Texas, not the Mexican claim to Texas, but the Mexican claim to the Texan claims that went beyond Texas. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about the Trans Nueces and the Upper Rio Grande. Uh, that's not part of Texas, never had been. Uh, and don't forget that not only did the feds build the San Jacinto Monument, they also drew the boundary for Western Texas. Congress did that, the United States Congress, not the Texans. Here's a question. There's a dead silence out there as I speak heresy. <laughs> <laughs> what percent of Mexican musket balls were made of lead and what percent of copper? Were there any copper musket balls found at San Jacinto? We, we have not yet found any uh, copper uh, musket balls. Uh, they, uh, th now, the very thought of a copper musket ball uh, may sound strange to some of you, but uh, uh, copper was such an abundant byproduct of the uh, silver mining in Mexico that it was used for unconventional purposes, uh, so, uh, but uh, the, the one about which uh, we know the most is, is for uh, artillery projectiles from uh, the uh, Dr. Demick finds it uh, at the Sea of Mud, which he can, he can describe in greater detail, and uh, some uh, recent finds uh, in the, uh, for example, the first tiny bit of work for the prairie restoration uh, where we recovered uh, a copper canister shot uh, uh, within the park. Um, as far as copper musket balls, uh, we have the, uh, as far as I know, the only person here that's found copper musket balls, the only one I know of is Terry Keeler. Terry, stand up for a second. Terry uh, uh, has moved to St. Louis, but he's come back for this. As far as I know, he found three or four copper musket balls in the sea of mud. I don't know why I never found any of them. 
but we found several hundred musket balls and we found three or four copper shot. Interestingly enough, the, the United States uh, was, the, the Americans were, were convinced that copper was poisonous and you were evil and vile and just Satan if you used copper shot because the person was going to die even if it was a minor wound. Uh, the Americans were more civilized. They used lead and that can't <laughs> hurt you. <laughs> Yeah, Herman Ehrenberg's memoir says exactly that, and of course we know that was exactly wrong. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Demick, but there is a, uh, a reaction, a chemical reaction between blood and copper, uh, which can produce irritation. As far as I know. Uh, irritation, which may make some people think that the copper is poison, but we know that lead is the more deadly uh, of the two. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Here's a question. Was General Koss killed at the Battle of San Jacinto? Yes. No, uh, he was not. Uh, and he was one of the VIPOWs. Uh, can you figure that one out? Uh, well, along with Santana and, uh, and El Monte and others. He's a, he's a VIPOW. Um, Manuel Hinojosa talked about a Mexican cavalry helmet. This may have to be the last question. I'm sorry if we can't get the, oh, let me ask one more because it's important. Uh, if we want to contribute uh, to the archeological work at San Jacinto, uh, uh, sponsored by the Friends of San Jacinto, uh, how do we make out the check? Uh, who do we <laughs> give it to? Say that again. And, that, and, and do you, should they mark on the check or support archaeological work? Yeah. Did you hear that? Make your check uh, directly to me. No. Uh, <laughs> make your check to the friends of the San Jacinto Battleground and indicate in the, uh, in the detail line that it is to support archaeological work. And then the last question, I'm, I'm afraid, is for uh, Manuel Hinojosa. In speaking uh, to the Mexican cavalry helmets, you suggested that uh, the style dates from colonial times. Uh, what era do you mean by colonial times? Well, I said the socket looks, looked very colonial. That leads me to believe that it was something that, that was a little bit earlier. Uh, uh, you know, keep in mind a lot of the, uh, the, the, helmet, the helmet style is very much of a neoclassical, what they call a Miramar type of design that was used by the French soldiers during Napoleon times. And there was four styles between 1905 and 1915 after Waterloo, of course, that didn't exist. It seemed, I, I would think that, that Mexico um, adopted that helmet and used it uh, till 39 when it was made obsolete. Uh, Mexico al also, what, what, what they would do is they would uh, enlist uh, foreign uh, officers that, to help them design and put together this, this uniform that was being used. Uh, one of the ones that comes to my mind, uh, Carlo Beniski, was was uh, an early uh, Iturbe the officer that that uh, uh, was uh, with uh, General Santana for most of the most of the time, and he had a lot to do with shaping the uh, the, the cavalry in, into what what you know what was in 1836. So the uh, it, it only happens that anything be before 1821 is colonial. And and uh, and I would say that a lot of the, the the colonial designs were sort of were 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 incorporated and were just something that that uh, continued on for years afterwards. Uh, Greg Demick has to leave immediately. He's got to be in a play tonight, and there's a flood between him and the play. Um, and so, uh, not only for Greg, but for all of the people, all of our speakers today, would you please give them one more uh, token of your appreciation?